Mathematics consists of the random collection of theorems that humans have managed to prove. However, when you see a theorem in a book, it's usually right where it is for a reason. Sometimes, even if a book doesn't tell you why it's there, a little bit of thought can help you intuit exactly what the theorem is really saying and what it is not saying. Doing this right sometimes takes looking at the contrapositive, looking at naming conventions and other clues within the chapter. As an easy example, I'd like to break down this theorem out of baby rooting for you. It is one of the first theorems in chapter three, which is titled Numerical Sequences and Series. It is easy to get carried away with your previous experience with sequences and limits in say calculus two and miss what the theorem is actually saying. Now theorems can actually preview some really deep concepts coming up later in your studies. For instance, this first one seems like just a neat fact, but this if and only if really makes a difference, and it means that this could be an alternative definition of a limit of a sequence for metric spaces. What should stand out to you is that this alternative definition doesn't actually use a metric at all. That Pn converges to P if for every neighborhood of P, that neighborhood contains all but finitely many of these Pn's. And this is actually how it's defined in topology. So here, Rudin is telling you how you can do this if you remove a metric altogether. This is really suspicious since we just left a chapter that was entirely dedicated to metrics. Rudin is quietly giving you the topological definition of a limit of a sequence. That is, we can declare a sequence as being convergent if for every open set containing P, only a finite collection of our sequence points will be outside of that open set. And that happens for any set, and if that's true, then that's a reasonable definition of limit of sequence and we can transport that over to topology. No need to talk about the metric here at all. Okay, so why don't we just go ahead and prove a couple of these ideas. So I'm gonna prove at least one direction of this to make it kind of clear. So you can start with the definition. Uh, so we have a sequence PN converges to a point P in X if, and now this is something that you just internalize during analysis, you'll write this so many times. If for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists some N in our natural numbers such that for all little n bigger than n, we are eventually going to be inside an epsilon neighborhood of p. Or rather, this is going to be epsilon close to p for all future n. So one way to say this is that for sufficiently large n, you're always going to get underneath epsilon. What we're going to do is we're going to retranslate that into a question about neighborhoods. So here we're saying that pn converges to p and x. And remember, part A says that that means that if we take any neighborhood of P, that only a finite number of ter the terms in our sequence are actually going to be outside of that neighborhood. And so we go ahead and we start with the neighborhood that we fixed would be epsilon, and that's sort of hinting at me going to be using this over here. We fix this epsilon greater than zero, and then we have this neighborhood of radius epsilon about P. So there exists some capital N and N such that for all N, greater than n, we have that the distance between pn and p is less than epsilon, which means that for all n greater than n, we have that pn is inside of the neighborhood of epsilon about p. Okay, but then that's true for this infinite number of n's that are larger than n. It's so where the finite ones, well, it turns out that if we take a look at, say, p1 through p2, up to Pn, we can say that at most, uh, these elements are not in n epsilon of P. And that's finite. So there we go. That is that direction of part A. Sometimes a theorem really tests how careful of a reader we've been. Take a look at this next one. It says that if a sequence converges, then it can only converge to a single point. Uh, that might seem obvious intuitively, but it does need to be established. This is a check to see how careful of a reader you are. If you look back at the definition of a limit of a sequence, Rudin told us that we can say P is equal to the limit of Pn, and you probably didn't even blink an eye. Until we prove part two of this theorem, we don't actually know that this limit of Pn is even well-defined. If a sequence could converge to two different points, then how would you decide which one gets to be called the limit of Pn? Thankfully, part two of this theorem tells us we don't have to face that question, and the limit is actually uniquely defined. So this was testing how careful of a reader you are. So what's really cool here is that metrics are saving the day again. If you remove metrics, and actually if you remove Hausdorff, from your topology, then it turns out that a sequence can actually converge to two different points at once. So this is actually a very particular thing about limits of a sequence 
for metric spaces, or, well, Hausdorff spaces. And it's another topology thing that Rudin is sort of sliding in. Okay, so I wanted to show you the proof of part B, and this is fairly straightforward, but what it does is it invokes the triangle inequality in a way that you're gonna use it a lot. And so it's a good idea to go ahead and talk about this at least a little bit. So we're gonna suppose that Pn is a sequence that converges to Pn P prime inside of some metric space X. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to show that the distance between P and P prime is equal to zero. And the way we're gonna do that is that, well, you know that the distance between P and P prime has to be positive. That's the definition of a metric. The way we'll show it zero is we'll show that it is gonna be less than any positive number. And when that happens, then that means that it is going to be zero. All right, and so we're gonna use what is called an epsilon over two argument. And you don't have to put an over two in there, it's just a nice clean way to show this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start this theorem the way that you'll start almost every theorem in real analysis, at least any time you're talking about convergence. So we're gonna let epsilon be greater than zero. And then we invoke this definition. So that means that there exists an n and n prime such that for all uh, n greater than n and n prime greater than capital N prime, we have that the distance between Pn and P is less than epsilon over two. And we have the distance between Pn and prime and P prime is less than epsilon over two. What we really did is we invoked this, this definition two different times for epsilon over two. But as all it still holds epsilon is positive, which means epsilon over two is positive, which means we can still use this. And we're gonna let n tilde to be equal to the max of n and n prime. Because I don't wanna keep invoking this twice. And so if you're gonna be bigger than the maximum of these two, then that means you're bigger than both of them, right? So there we go. All right, so now let's go ahead and invoke the triangle inequality. So I'm gonna take this term that I wanna get control over, the distance between P and P prime, I'm gonna split it up with our sequence. And so it's gonna be less than or equal to the distance between P and Pn, plus the distance between Pn and P. This is gonna be less than epsilon over two, plus epsilon over two uh, for n bigger than n tilde, which means that it's less than epsilon. And since we just selected epsilon to be completely arbitrary, that means that this is as small as we want it to be, which means it's zero. If you didn't choose epsilon over two here, so here and here, then basically what you're gonna end up with is like a two epsilon. But that's fine because you could just, you know, being smaller than two epsilon, you just pick your epsilon to be half of what it was and you get an epsilon out of here. You just have to make sure the constant that multiplies this epsilon doesn't depend on epsilon itself. And so we have shown distance between P and P prime is equal to zero, which implies that P is equal to P prime by the definition of our metric. Now, some parts of the theorem are more useful if we apply them backwards. The third part of the theorem tells us something we'd like to know about convergent sequences. That is, if we have a convergent sequence, then that sequence must be bounded. This seems pretty unremarkable, honestly, but it does give us one strong test to show that a sequence is divergent. That is, if we have an unbounded sequence, it can't converge. That sort of thing can come in handy more often than you think. So literally after I recorded the A-roll, everything with me talking here, I actually was tutoring a student in partial differential equations and they confronted this one theorem where it didn't tell them whether or not a sequence converged. They just said, determine the convergence properties of the sequence. And it was something like this. You know, so here, if I take a look at the L1, you can't even see that, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll put it here. So we're gonna have this metric that is the integral from zero to one of f of x minus g of x dx. And this is a metric on the space of continuous functions on the interval zero to one. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna determine the convergence or divergence of the sequence of functions that is basically gonna be a triangle. So it's gonna have a base that is from zero to one over n and then zero after that. And the peak of the triangle is gonna be at n squared. And so what we wanna know is that as n goes to infinity, does the sequence of functions converge? Now, if you wanna show it converge, then that means you need to find a function it should converge to. And if you look at it point-wise, it actually is gonna be converging to zero because as the 
n gets very, very large, that all those points that are non-zero are just gonna be going away. And so then we're sort of filling out this interval with zeros. But it turns out it doesn't converge. The way you can do that is you can say, take a look at the distance of you know these this sequence from the zero function, and which is really just gonna be the area underneath that triangle, which ends up being n over two. And so as n goes to infinity, the distance between zero and that sequence goes to infinity as well. And so we know it's an unbounded sequence and therefore it cannot converge. So even though this theorem is relatively short, there's actually a lot of implicit information in here. And it also hints at concepts you might confront in the future, like convergent sequences and topology. Just remember, challenge everything in a book, ask why until you can't anymore, and that's the best way to get through analysis and any other mathematics subject. So now that we know how to read a theorem, how do we read a proof? And that is what this video is here for. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a good day.